that, let's welcome Nathan West. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. Uh, yeah, so I'm Nathan West, Principal Engineer at DeepSig. Um, so I just want to over, give an overview of the things we're working on um, because there's been a lot of interest in uh, deep learning applied to wireless communications, uh, and that's good to see. Um, so just a quick overview of what we're doing. Um, so who are we? Um, we've contributed to GNU Radio for a long time. Um, if you know uh, my name, I've run Volk. Uh, ben Hilburn uh, is the current president of the foundation and is sort of uh, administratively leading the project. Um, Tim O'Shea is also on our team. He's done a lot of the digital uh, work and packet, packet work in GNU Radio. Um, so that's kind of the background that we're coming from. Um, uh, let's see, so we're also uh, venture-backed, um, so there was that uh, Death Valley picture. I like to think that we're crossing Death Valley and uh, going from our academic uh, backgrounds where we've developed this in universities and now uh, commercializing it, and we're hopefully going to be out of Death Valley soon. Um, and we think that uh, replacing the expert-based uh, DSP that we're doing in software radio with, machine, with deep learning, uh, we think that we're the first ones... Um, really bringing this to the market. Um, so there's also this, I'm going to have uh, papers sort of throughout this, um, not in every slide, but here's a quick article that's not very uh, academically rigorous, but it's just a Comsoc tech news article. Um, it gives sort of a parallel to this uh, written down of like an, a high-level overview of uh, this new field. Uh, so we see the core challenges uh, of wireless communications is uh, increasing complex complexity and the high degree of freedom uh, you have when designing a wireless system. So this is, uh, you will probably recognize this top right figure from um, Bernard Sklar's classic uh, digital communications textbook. I uh, recreated a version of it. Um, so this is actually outdated now. So each piece has many choices to make. And then um, now there's actually multiple antennas, right? So uh, there's just a lot of uh, choices to make. By the time you've made one choice out of 10 or 20 uh, from each box, you now have just this huge combinatorial explosion. Um, and managing that is becoming uh, increasingly in, just very complex. Um, so t let's take an example. Um, for error correction, we have polar codes, which are uh, capacity achieving. Um, so now, great, we can transmit through uh, a particular channel at uh, near Shannon capacity. So now we've gone through hardware, and um, polar codes don't correct for uh, if our amplifier brings in a nonlinearity. Um, now we have to do a digital pre-distortion. All right, so uh, that's just two points in the chain. And every it seems like uh, every time you make one correction, now uh, another pops out, and we have to keep doing that through the whole chain. So uh, we're working on end-to-end -end learned radio systems. So whatever impairments exist, uh, whatever nonlinearities exist, um, whatever environment you're propagating through, whether it's RF or optical, then uh, we just learn, have the machine learn um, a nonlinear transform that is uh, that works very well. Uh, so these are our two solutions. These are actually our product names, but I don't want to do too much uh, marketing here. So we have OmniFi, OmniSig. Um, OmniFi is referring to the end-to-end. -end. You feed in bits, and then you get out bits. Uh, and it's an end-to-end -end wireless link synthesis. Uh, our sensing stuff is OmniSig. Um, so that's understanding what's in uh, the RF environment and um, detecting uh, whatever bursts are out there, whatever signals are out there. Um, so this is the core piece of it, is we have some hardware that's doing analog to digital conversion and digital to analog conversion. Um, the differentiable part and the differentiable baseband processing is actually pretty important to deep learning. Um, 
to do the, the actual learning piece of this is that you compute some error function or some loss function that represents how suboptimal your system currently is. Um, and then you take that and uh, there's this algorithm called backpropagation uh, where you pr backpropagate your error to each of the, um, each of the variables that you have. And uh, one way to think about backpropagation is it's commonly uh, thought of as the chain rule uh, applied to uh, layers of composed functions. Um, so every part of your system in a deep learned system has to be differentiable. Uh, and it turns out that's, a, uh, that's actually a challenge when doing end-to-end -end wireless systems is because your wireless environment is not differentiable. Um, so we'll get to that, solving that problem uh, in a little bit. Um, the high-level objective function could be, it's whatever you are trying to achieve with your system, whether it's uh, quality of service or um, trying to stay within some linear range or uh, a frequency, doing some uh, restriction on what frequencies you're using or how much power you're using. Um, so the analogy that we make here is this software 2.0. Um, I won't assume that you guys have read uh, the deep learning literature. So there's a very influential deep learning professor who then went on to work at various like open AI type places, uh, Andre, Andrew or Andre Karpathy. Um, he termed this, this idea of software 2.0, where uh, deep learning is another tool in the toolbox. And um, it's, it's often considered just a black box that, that you don't really have to understand. Uh, you don't know what's actually happening in your network, but it also doesn't matter. Um, so he's termed that software 2.0, where instead of writing systems that you can understand, deep learning is now uh, a new tool that's used uh, to create complex software and algorithms. Um, so we're just applying this to DSP software, just like software 2.0. Um, so we think there are lots of reasons to do this, uh, both in power, sensitivity, and um, just compute time, uh, and rapidly iterating on uh, improved systems. So a quick primer, because the autoencoder architecture is pretty important for end-to-end -end systems. Um, on the right, I borrowed images from Andre. Uh, so he has this, he taught this course at Stanford. Um, and this is just taken from his convolutional networks course on the right. The left image is not. Uh, so this is two ways of viewing uh, deep, learn, uh, deep neural network. Um, one, you, so you have these volumes that you're doing this convolution on. Um, so you can view it as volumes, like on the bottom, or you can view it as layers. Um, they're both valid, and uh, that's the idea of what we're talking about here. Um, and I'm also going to use these uh, columns or convolutions a lot. Um, they're a little, they're very similar to the convolutions we think of in term in like ordinary DSP and SDR. Uh, the convolutional layers, and I'll usually be referring to a convolutional layer, uh, is actually substantially different, and it can be incredibly confusing when you're coming from a strong DSP background. Uh, what, what actually happens is you have a, a kernel or a filter. So uh, on the top right, one of those circles would be a filter. Um, and it operates on the depth of the input. So what happens is you feed in time series data. And um, you'll feed in, uh, so often what we do is we feed in, we separate the I and the Q channels and then feed that into a convolutional layer. The convolutional layer will operate on the I and Q separately and then sum them. Then the output of that layer is, uh, you have one output for every filter that is in that layer. So say you have 64 filters in a layer, uh, the next input channel would have 64 different inputs. Each filter in that next layer would operate its convolution on each channel and then sum them together. So it's not, they're still doing convolutions, but it's not the, uh, the FIR type uh, filter that you're used to thinking of. Um, to add another wrench to this, you almost always do some nonlinearity on the output of the convolution sum. 
Um, often that's what's called a ReLU. It's a rectified linear unit. Think of it exactly like a rectifier. If it's below zero, then you throw it away, keep it at zero. If it's above zero, then it's a linear operation. Um, and you do that just to introduce, it turns out that any kind of nonlinearity uh, is useful in these types of networks um, and allows you to learn very complex function mappings. So you, you do this forward pass uh, where you compute uh, it's, it's each layer here, each con layer is a function, and then you compose them so that you have a six layer deep function approximation where the function is all these nonlinear sums of convolutions. And you just wind up with this huge combinatorial space that you can represent. So the autoencoder is a particular combination here where it has this pattern of starting out at a large basis function. So you'll put in maybe a thousand samples, uh, not that that's particularly large, but you would put in a thousand samples, then shrink that down to maybe 32. So you have, you just do this compression and then you do this expansion. Uh -oh. uh, and the goal is actually to get, uh, I wrote input data, but the goal is to reproduce on the output what you put in uh, to the network. That doesn't seem very useful, uh, except that that is the problem of wireless communications, uh, as Claude Shannon put it, um, to put in, to reproduce at one point where what you had at another point. Um, so we leveraged this autoencoder architecture, and it was actually not created specifically for radio. It was created by people doing image processing. Um, it just so happens that they've built a lot of tools to uh, analyze autoencoders, and they're very useful for radio. Um, so we have this structure here on the right where we have an encoder network. Um, so when I say encoder and decoder, the left part is going to be the encoder, and then the right part is going to be the decoder where we stretch out. Um, so we have this encoder, and then we put in channel effects into the middle, and then uh, we have our decoder. And so you put in random bits, and then you get out bits that should represent what you put in. Then you compute the loss, uh, and if, if you create if you write the channel effects in a differentiable way then, and using a differentiable language, then you can backpropagate through your decoder, through your channel, and uh, your encoder. So then you have an end-to-end -end optimized system. Uh, it turns out this works very well. And um, the first autoencoder came out for wireless communications, came out in 2016 uh, by Tim O'Shea. Um, yeah, is there anything else here? Yeah, so uh, then he was working with uh, Jakob Hoytis, uh, who there's, right now there's about, two, there's probably two branches uh, where they started together and they're taking slightly different paths. Um, and they wrote this journal paper together that's, that's for the past two years, or for the past year, uh, it's been uh, the most, if you go to IEEE Explore and look at uh, transactions on cognitive communications and networks, it's the most popular article. Um, so there's certainly a lot of interest in this. The, the important thing here is that you actually can, with this approach uh, with white Gaussian noise, you can match the rate of what we expect theoretically um, for different modulation schemes. Um, so for uncoded, well, yeah, so for uncoded BPSK going through a white Gaussian noise channel, uh, it, it matches uh, well with um, the autoencoder approach. Uh, and you get out constellations that look like what you would expect. Um, so that's not that useful if it only ever works in an additive white Gaussian noise channel. Um, so we've also demonstrated uh, some MIMO approaches, um, but you can simulate any kind of RF environment uh, in your channel. And as long as it's differentiable, then you can backpropagate through it and do a joint optimization. Um, and both Jakob's group and our group have independently transmitted over the air with these types of links. Um, and that's to say that this is not just a purely academic exercise. Um, 
this is able to work over the air using uh, using analytic channel models uh, that match. We haven't used uh, like standards-based channel models, but using uh, multipath and um, uh, center frequency offsets and sample rate offsets, uh, you are able to backpropagate through and create optimal encodings. Um, so here is just an example. I think this. Nope. All right. Um, so here's an example where uh, through a white Gaussian noise channel, you, you we get out the constellation that you would expect to find. Um, I think this was actually supposed to be animated, but um, that doesn't really matter. So this loss function is what we're actually optimizing here. And this is usually a binary cross entropy loss. Um, and uh, the constellation points are all, they wind up being equidistant. Um, let's see. So uh, just more comparisons of uh, block error rates. Um, so one of the projects that we worked on fairly early and is still ongoing is um, NASA has TDRS, the satellite that does uh, relays for uh, telemetry data. And they have this uh, high-powered TWIDA amplifier, so that's a traveling wave tube amplifier. Um, and they wanted to know, it's a fairly old amplifier, but it, the satellite is still incredibly useful. So they wanted to know, is there a link that we, that we can design uh, to make better use of the throughput of the satellite? Um, so they had previously looked at doing uh, digital pre-distortion, and they had success with that, as you would expect. Um, so we, we took in their, the white papers of their uh, amplifier measurements. Um, so we took in the AM, AM, and AM, PM distortions, uh, built a channel model to represent their amplifier. Um, and then this is the result of training. And so with different, the, the network, the autoencoder structure that you use uh, determines what your constellation size is, right? So that, sort of makes sense. Uh, you have to design how many constellation, how many potential points you want in your alphabet. Um, and then uh, our result was that we were able to operate in regions of the amplifier that could not previously be used. Um, and we all, we based this entire model on the Phillips model um, where someone took a Phillips semiconductor amplifier and um, had an AMPM model off of it. And so that it's, it's the same model type that's been used uh, for other types of analysis, and um, we've been able to backpropagate through it. We are hoping to, to actually transmit uh, this signal over the air uh, very soon. Um, so I mentioned earlier that one problem is that if you actually have a wireless environment, you can't backpropagate through that. So, and you may just not have an analytical channel model. So if you're in a dense urban environment, um, good luck. I mean, you can do a statistical model of that, but in general, good luck modeling it accurately. And in fact, um, there's been some, some papers on propagation modeling that discuss how the standards-based models are actually not representative of current urban deployments um, for cellular type systems. And that's actually because the trend has been towards making smaller cells and bringing uh, the, the base stations closer to the ground. So the delay spread is actually not as bad as uh, the standards-based models um, predict for urban environments. Um, so with this approach, you could do over-the-air training and uh, you never, it doesn't matter if you're deployment doesn't match the channel model um, because we'll learn to overcome it over the air. Uh, so anyway, the approach here is that we add this um, to our, we add a channel approximation here. Uh, is there a laser pointer here? All right. All right, so we still have our channel approximation here, except instead of an analytical channel model that we've designed from some uh, to have whatever fading characteristics we want, we uh, have this uh, adversarial approach. Um, so another, so adversarial networks are another just generic deep learning thing that we've applied to RF. Um, so the approach is that you have a physical environment here, and you have this approximation, 
And you optimize all of this jointly so that um, you want this channel approximation, which is differentiable, to match this physical channel. So you put in random bits. Uh, you get your RF representation. Then you propagate. You go through a real radio. You go through a real transmitter and a real receiver. Then put that through, keep that around, and then put, uh, do your decoding. All right, so now you compute a loss function for this so that your channel approximation matches. So this is its own problem, this x to y mapping. And you want your channel approximation to be trained uh, to look like the physical channel. And so the reason this is an adversarial network is because you have a discrimination network which attempts to determine, is this thing, whatever it is, in this case, it's some RF impairment, from the real data set, or is it from uh, the created data set? Um, and what happens is that you learn to mimic whatever real system uh, you're, you're interacting with. Um, so this gives you the ability to transmit over any physical channel with real hardware and approximate that hardware and then use that approximation to do your end-to-end -end optimization. So now you have an encoder and a decoder that's actually been trained to work well over a physical channel. Um, so this is what our channel autoencoder loss looks like. And you can see that it uh, decreases. Um, so first, it decreases slowly at first uh, while our channel loss decreases. So we learn the channel first. And then uh, we accelerate our channel autoencoder loss once we've uh, done a good job approximating the channel. So this is, uh, in terms of end-to-end -end wireless learned links, this right here is currently the most exciting thing um, of actually being able to do a joint optimization across real channels. Um, so now, slightly different topic. Uh, OmniSig is the sensing side of things. So we started out with uh, the single carrier approach. Um, and that goes all the way back to 2014. Um, there's been lots of stuff published on this. Uh, the DARPA Rifimals program was based on this. So, um, all this went into a seedling that eventually became Rifmol's. Um, we've shown that it's outperformed for, for doing single carrier type modulations um, across real channel impairments. Uh, it out, this approach generally outperforms expert, the best expert-based systems you can throw at it. Um, so there was a specific comparison done against Classic, which was developed by DARPA. Um, I think it was actually developed by people at UCLA for DARPA. Um, so the convolutional neural networks approach tends to work very well. Um, there's been some residual or uh, uh, recurrent networks and residual networks um, that also work well. So there's just been a constant evolution of better neural networks. Um, so one reasonable question would be, all right, the networks keep getting slightly better. Uh, now what? So if you don't have uh, neural network space background. Um, I think where this will go is that there's, in neural networks in general, and deep learning in general, there is um, you know, an approach called neuroevolution, where instead of humans putting together neural networks and designing what the architecture looks like, it's just treated as another optimization problem. This particular problem will probably go that way, where what the network looks like doesn't matter. We don't know. Well, you will know, but it, it just doesn't mean anything. Um, it'll probably just be designed by a machine uh, as another optimization problem. Uh, so this is also, this not only outperforms things like Classic, which is based on cyclostationary features, uh, but it actually is a lot. So you can't understand it because it's a black box, but it uh, is much simpler to create. Lot, a lot of people have recreated convolutional neural networks that do very well. Um, very few people would be able to accurately reproduce something on the order of uh, classic and do it properly um, because it's very complex. So being able to actually build systems is simplified. And it's also just less compute power. Um, and we can operate on GPUs. Um, one of the nice things about neural networks is that every hardware vendor seems to be wanting to support it. So um, 
There's support coming from Xilinx, I think. Works on GPUs, works on CPUs. Um, yeah, and there's been other work outside of Xilinx where people have taken uh, high-level synthesis type approaches where they write uh, HLS type C or C++ and then compile that down to uh, into RFNOC, and that's worked too. And we have uh, vetted these models also over the air. Um, so again, doing real channel propagation, uh, and this, this works well. Uh, so this is just to show off a couple of our tools that we have. So um, we've moved beyond just the single carrier type detection, and we're doing multi-carrier and uh, bursted communications, uh, where we try to identify everything that's in the spectrum across time and frequency. Um, and there's plenty of applications for this. Uh, and we've um, also done this over the air. So we've done real um, cellular systems, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. And I think, yeah, so this is uh, just a quick demo of it. It's not live, um, but this is roughly what the user interface looks like. And then it also has a stream out of, um, of, of its JSON but it's, uh, it tells you when and where things pop up in the in spectrum. So uh, this, a lot of times, it's uh, not always obvious why this type of spectrum sensing is um, useful, except that you do see weird things pop up when you actually look at spectrum carefully. So like here, someone has put a GSM station um, basically on top of their LTE carrier and that's probably not a great thing to do. Um, and the narrow bands things, uh, so we have these labels. This particular demonstration just isn't quite uh, labeling them. Uh, so we, you don't necessarily see the narrow band carriers in there, but you can see on the spectral, uh, on the PSD, that there are channels there. I think they're P25. Um, and you can see that we're able to pick those up at pretty low SNRs. Um, and this works all over uh, um, over a website. So it's the actual computational burden of looking at this is very low. And you can control, you can hop. Right now, we're working off of uh, USERP B205s. And we can hop fast. The bottleneck on hopping through, through spectrum and identifying everything there is actually the settle time of retuning the usurp. Um, so that's kind of exciting for us. Uh, so uh, just slightly more marketing stuff. We're um, fairly open about things. We've published a lot of papers that are mostly on archive. Um, there's a pretty constant stream of papers coming out. The field is moving very fast. Um, and other people or other groups are definitely starting to work on this. And if you are working in this area, uh, I'm interested in hearing what you're doing and um, knowing about it. If you have paper recommendations to read, happy to hear those. Um, we have, we use a bunch of different open source tools. So we're not developing everything from the ground up. Um, and I want to give full credit to everyone who open sources tools that we're working on. Um, we also have a Docker container that has a lot of these tools ready to go. Um, published on our website. So you can go to deepsig.io slash tools. Um, and it has, as long as you have CUDA installed on your host machine, then you can start up the Docker. And you'll have access to usurps and CUDA and be able to have uh, all the different machine, like deep learning frameworks um, ready to go. We've also published data sets. So if you're doing single carrier modulation recognition, um, we've published data sets that are commonly used. Um, I see other people are also frequently creating new data sets. Um, hopefully, eventually, we can converge on a single set of uh, data sets to compare on like other fields do. But we'll get there eventually. Um, and yeah, we have a lot more tools and data sets that we have plans to release some point in the future. Um, so we're happy to work with people, too. Uh, so radio design is becoming data science. There's just too many options to actually expertly design everything uh, altogether. And there's too many rapidly different environments. 
But radios are able to generate data at a really high pace. Um, and so uh, data is the key, especially labeled data. If you know what your data is, then uh, that's incredibly valuable. And we have fairly mature tools at this point for doing machine learning with RF systems. Um, and we're, yeah, we're interested in working with anyone out there. We're also hiring um, to do another plug. Uh, if you go to our website, we'll have some jobs posted. Uh, thanks. I think I can take questions. Yeah, Jeff. What do you use as the, uh, the feature vector for the input to the neural network? A lot of samples, FFT? Oh, this is for the detection stuff? Uh, yeah, so for the input, we, um, we, it depends on which one we're talking about specifically. Um, for this, uh, the input to this specific network that's running to generate these boxes is a uh, spectrogram. But we do have a version that is, well, I have a version that's still experimental that's just samples. Mr. Oil and Coder, is it fair to say that you're designing both the CX and the RX together? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, the we the object the loss function that you calculate to minimize is the the cross entropy between s and s prime. So those are s and s prime in our case are bits or symbols um, or symbols from your alphabet. So they're not like QPSK symbols, but it'll be like zero to three for QPSK. So that is, uh, that's a big challenge too, because you can't just throw away old, like, the past 60 years of radio, right? Um, so no one has demonstrated doing that yet. Um, what we have demonstrated is that you can, you can correct some impairments in front of an existing receiver. So if an existing receiver you could put in a neural network based equalizer right in front of an OFDM system. Um, you could do that. Um, no one that I know of has done go from raw RF to decoding an LTE frame. That would be very interesting. Yeah. Are there channels that are not different? So is this like taking a wireless propagation channel? Yeah. Well, and associated RF impairments, because I noticed that you were successful with uh, memory non-linearity. I yeah. thought if there's any channel that's not differentiable, it wasn't that one. Uh, where was that? Uh, the, the TV stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, right, so it depends. That matter, the, so. What matters is how you program the model, right? So we we built we use TensorFlow to write a um, write an AM AM an AM PM channel or a model, and since we use TensorFlow operations, uh, it is differentiable. So it's not so much that the actual channel is differentiable; your model, yeah, channel has to be that's right. And that, that is the key to the adversarial. Uh, that's why uh, That's why this model is so useful. It's because we learn to approximate a real channel that's not differentiable. And as long as that approximation is very good, then you're able to do the autoencoder on an no otherwise non-differentiable channel. Uh, the, okay, yeah. So you are using randomly activation, which is handled by linear sigmoid or some other activation? 
Yeah, uh, so activation functions are, um, I would call them another hyperparameter. Um, we've tried various, so a couple, uh, maybe a year ago, Swish came out. That was a uh, sigmoid multiplied by linear. Um, and they had all kinds of great things to say about Swish. Um, so we've tried that. We've tried ReLUs. We've tried sigmoids. Um, it, it doesn't appear to, so it, it makes a difference on how fast your code runs because some of them, ReLU is much faster than a sigmoid. Um, and sometimes training is faster with ReLU too. Um, it appears to be just another hyperparameter that, yeah. I don't know, have you seen anything interesting with non-ReLU activation functions? No, so okay. mostly people just, uh, signal mass emission people go for ReLU. Yeah. Why they just want to go to Yeah, everyone uses ReLU's. Um, why? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's like, so uh, for the non-neural network people, there's also, so the size of the convolutions that we talked about, the filters, they're usually on the order of three or five taps. That's like nothing for us, right? So uh, why use three or five? It just seems to work well. Uh, yeah. And there was one back there. What is your throughput? What is your throughput? Throughput. Oh, uh, in, uh, so for this approach, uh, I think we've done, we've, we, there's a paper about this on archive. I think that it says it's one mega sample per second. Um, don't quote me on that, though. See the paper for the actual number. Uh, let's see. Uh, that was on the autoencoder. This one. Here. Objective functions. Um, so there are transformer networks out there, uh, and Tim. You've probably seen them. He has uh, the radio transformer network. It, it appears that that's useful. Um, it's not in a lot of, it's not commonly used. And we don't commonly use it. Um, but yeah, yeah. It, they each have their own applications, it seems like. And so like the, art, the, regis the radio transformer network could be useful for existing, correcting impairments on existing standards, right? So if you have some, you you so the red, the radio transform networks are a way of um, doing an expert transformation or learning a parameter on an expert transformation like a center frequency offset. Um, so that I think that would be useful for correcting putting in front of an existing system. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was a paper. I think it was by Jakob's group that used. Did an OFDM equalization with a register or a radio transform network. Um, so you have to look for that. It's on archive. It's one of the great things about this domain is everything's on archive. Not yet. Uh, so, I mean, the channel is always changing, right? Because people are moving in the environment. So, yeah, you're able to freeze the, freeze the model, and it still works in that environment. The question of if you trained it in our office and then took it out on the open ocean, would it still work? I, I don't know. Uh, it's important to understand that, yes. Uh, but we haven't done that kind of thing yet. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, so is that like can you can you freeze the the learned channel and then reuse it offline? Kind of, yeah. Um, like if you're generating like the channel, it's like kind of like in the in the game like the first example that you're generating like the right. Right. So I, I, I think that you could reuse that learned approximation of the channel for other things. Um, I think you definitely could reuse it. And you, the, the inputs, right, so b unless you do a variational autoencoder, the inputs are always going to map to the same outputs. Um, but if you used a variational approach to, uh, to your, in your GAN, then you could have a realistic uh, varying always varying channel model.